Actually, I'll, I'll go back a slide before I reveal that. Um, so uh, as we talked about, Galapagos is just the out-of-the-box evolutionary solver or out-of-the-box generative design tool for Grasshopper. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to explore this is with Revit 2021, Autodesk uh, finally released their generative design, formerly known as Refinery, uh, along with Revit. So it's no longer beta, it's like a released version of that. And we wanted to bring up like that, yes, that tool is fine, but it's not necessarily the end-all be-all and you have other options using Rhino inside. So maybe generative design works for you. Maybe you want something slightly different. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can go about generative design solutions for your projects. Um, and I think ideally we would explore uh, some of the other options such as like maybe a discover or a wallace uh, i think i pronounced that correctly i don't i don't really know um but because those have multi-objective uh solvers for the evolutionary algorithm versus Galap galapagos is apparently only a single uh, objective evolutionary solver which had completely slipped my mind when i built this uh, demo so bear with me here on that uh, but essentially in getting to do this demo i wanted it to be while it's going to be in just the nature of it being a demo, relatively simplistic, I did want to approach it as it was, as if it were an actual design problem. So in this case, uh, looking at Chicago's Millennium Park as maybe something to base a design problem off of. Uh, wonderful space if you haven't been there, especially in the summer when they have the concerts, just truly fantastic. Um, but the idea here is you have a semi-covered outdoor space. I guess Millennium Park's really not even semi-covered. It's more or less open with just kind of a, a structure thing over your head with lights attached to it. Um, but essentially, what's beautiful about it is not only are you looking at a stage for musicians or performers of whatever nature, um, but also you have the city as a backdrop. So you see uh, some of Chicago's skyscrapers and, and the beauty of the skyline while you're sitting out there listening to music. And I wanted to recreate that with this um, generative design demo. So in order to generatively design something or optimize something, you really need to have your metrics figured out and figure out exactly what you're designing for and what, does, what defines success in those metrics. So you can measure whatever you want, but it really, like measuring something doesn't really matter unless you understand or trust that the thing you're measuring matters and that the way you're measuring it is the correct way of measuring it. So the two things that I chose to measure, and then because Galapagos is a single objective evolutionary solver, I was only able to um, run it for one of these objectives was the view quotient, as I called it, which is essentially if you're sitting in the seated area, we're going to assume that you can see the band stage just by the nature of it. Maybe it's a slightly sloped lawn so that everyone has a view, but also we want to make sure that any covering over your head allows for views towards the buildings behind you. And then also a shadow quotient. So one thing that Millennium Park doesn't have is on the hot day, it's completely open, so there's no shade. Um, so perhaps as an additional thing, we can implement some sort of shading features so that you're not just baking in the sun in the middle of the day. Um, and ideally, if you were to have a multi-objective generative design, these two would play off of each other where the view quotient would want something more open, the shadow quotient would want something more closed, and you'd find an equilibrium based on either you want them equal or you want the view quotients to take priority or the shadow quotient to take priority. Um, in a more complex brief, you would do something like that. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're only measuring one for now. Uh, so here's a... Um, so you might have a lawn here with seating zones. Uh, initially, I conceptualized some concession stands that might want some more shading, but um, those were taken out as the Galapagos script took a while to run and we needed to reduce complexity. Um, and then also some buildings here. So if you think about this as like Millennium Park in Chicago, you have your seating zones, you're looking at the band shell, and then beyond the band shell over the tree line, you have a view of the skyscrapers, and you can see that in section here. So how we might measure this is if we were to divide the seating zones into a grid with center points here, and then the building meshes or buildings into meshes with center points here, we could measure 
if you could see a direct line from this point to this point, this point to this point, this point to this point, and so on and so forth, and then check if they intersect with anything here. And if they don't intersect, we'll keep the lines, and then when we keep the lines, we'll have an idea of how many or how um, unobstructed the view is. So if you, if you have a potential of, say, 1 to 12 views from this one spot and the first six are obstructed, then you'll know you'll have a view quotient in this particular case of eight. Versus this one being further back, you might be able to see uh, the lower level or something like that. And then initially, though it's, go ahead. Yeah. Right. I think part of it is as someone who came through as an architect or a designer, and I, I still like to think of myself as a designer, even if I'm not in like the architecture medium directly. Um, I think maybe just because I was in the architecture field and that's like visual and physical, I'm like predisposed to being a little more visual with how I think about things and, and reason through things. And I really need to draw out relationships so that I understand, okay, this is maybe the best way to do it or one of the ways that could actually accomplish what I'm looking for. And especially because it is so inherently physical visual like seeing it on paper really helps me reason through the logic. Uh, whether that's like something like this where it's directly architecture or something a little more abstract with coding where you're just like maybe making something up and calling something that's really abstract a point and then you're drawing relationships between abstractions like that. Like I think either way, um, sketching it out really helps reason through things. That's great. I think uh, I might be having yeah. some audio issues and it might be uh, related to my video audio stream. So I'm just going to turn on my video to see if that helps get the audio. But Chris, keep keep go ahead and keep taking it because I don't know if, if people can hear my voice. So go ahead and keep going. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Uh, so I actually did reason out this shadow quotient as well um, and included it in the grasshopper script only to realize or um, be reminded of the fact that Galapagos can only optimize one thing at a time. But um, that being said, one way to look at a shadow quotient might be if we had sun vectors coming down, uh, perhaps sometime that's really hot, like the middle of June uh, in the evening where you might have a concert, like what would that shadow look like? So if you had a, a really um, solid uh, covering, you would have a shadow on the ground versus you had a really open covering, you'd have a partial shadow and partial uh, lighting. So one way to measure this might be the percentage of the seating zone that's covered by shadow. So if it's, if it's half covered, you have a, a 0.5, if it's three quarters covered, 0.75, and etc. Um, so that would be another objective we might be able to use. Um, another thing I just, I really want to hit hard before getting into the actual script and the actual um, implementation of this technology is just one of the other reasons that I sketched all of this out as a design problem is I think that no matter how well you implement the technology of really tuned into how your design process actually works and, and you're not really tuned into what you as a designer 
or your client or your other fellow designers really consider as like appropriate metrics and successful metrics for a space, generative design is never going to give you exactly what you want. Well, I guess in a way, you're always going to have to simplify a problem down a little bit just to get it to fit into an algorithm. So it'll never give you exactly what you want. But the more you can understand how it inter interacts with your design process and the more you can understand what metrics are important and how to successfully measure those metrics, which could actually be pretty hard for some of the more qualitative metrics, um, the more successful your generative design solution will be and the more reasonable your outcomes will be. So I think that's another reason why I sketched this out um, in a little more complexity than just kind of like putting together something that's technically possible. Um, because I really wanted to at least a little bit get into the values of it, get into like, what do we actually care about as designers here? And I think views are sort of the low hanging fruit to that end, but um, I'm, I'm hopefully we can get into a little more complexity as, as the problems get uh, get more complex. I think in a real world design scenario, that would, that would very much have to be the case. That's great. Thank you, Chris. So, um, so one of the questions yeah. I asked earlier when I was muted, sorry about that, guys. Hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, one of the questions I asked, too, is what's your guys' experience with some of these tools? Are you guys using Grasshopper, Dynamo, Refinery? If you guys can, leave in the comments, either YouTube, Facebook, or on the website in the comments, you might have to sign in. Uh, just leave a comment there. We're curious to see where you guys are at with some of these some of these tools. This is great, Chris. Keep going. I think this is awesome. Okay. Uh, so you might recognize this floor plan or site plan. It's, it's the same one from here. Uh, just brought into Revit now in, in, in really simple massing shapes. So we have this lawn, we have the buildings we're shooting for, we have the band shell, and we have these green areas surrounding uh, this, this place. Uh, the other thing I have here is if you imagine this as a tree line, uh, it's not exactly a tree line, but um, it's basically, it's, what it is, it's, it's a wall with an edited profile to accommodate some of the variety of trees. So obviously, because this is simplified down from real, real life, we'll never really be able to get the, the whole complexity of the treescape unless you like do a point cloud scan. But for now, this will, this will help us approximate exactly what we're trying to accomplish. And then you'll see the massings of the buildings and everything here. So I guess one thing to touch on with the, the Revit or Rhino inside Revit stuff is that uh, I mentioned earlier that this is now possible as opposed to just relying on generative design through Autodesk and the tools that they provide. Um, and the reason it's possible is with this Rhino inside if you haven't seen this interface yet. Uh, so if you go to add-ins and you click Rhino, it'll start and then it'll show up here. And then what we can do is literally open up Rhino um, as, as a feature inside of Revit. So, um, and it has like a much more direct connection to uh, to the things inside of Rhino or verse in Revit and vice versa. So let's get to this. In creating this script, where did I put my grasshopper? I minimized that and I don't know where it went on my window. Oh, here we go. So the first thing we'll need to do in order to get this in here is you'll see that I have this surface here and these three buildings here. I don't think I actually need those. Um, and what those are, are these faces and this surface or this floor here. So I have those linked into Grasshopper and Grasshopper is this great face tool here now. So when you open Grasshopper inside of Revit, you come up with all these tools and if you hit face, you'll be able to place this face piece here. Bear, me, bear with me, it's a little slow. Uh, and then from there, you'll be able to set one or set multiple Revit faces. So that's what this is. And then from there, I got the curves from, I got the curves from that face uh, so that we could build out a surface. So these nodes here, getting the sides of the curve, then dividing the curve um, into NURBS curves. And what this guy here is doing is that if we divide these curves into points here and then vary the Z axis, we'll get these wavy lines that I have here. I'll leave 
those on for a second. And then I'm doing the same thing again with these lines. So we're varying that up. And then what I have here is if we divide those lines, these lines here, into points, we'll be able to build this sort of wavy, parametric looking surface. So I guess in design terms, this doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's sort of randomly generated. But for this exercise, I just wanted to get some sort of covering that looks cool and has a variety of shapes so that when we do the generative design stuff, uh, we can actually get a, a varied output. So I'll turn all this off. Turn this off. From there, we can go and get a bunch of surfaces. So if we divide that up into surfaces here, um, we now have a grid structure into which we can place holes or keep solid if we want to keep solid. And then, let's see. Essentially what that is, is if I go to shaded here, you can see these boxes here. And this box is solid, this box has a small hole, and this box has a large hole. And this is what we're going to do with, um, with our grid is what we're going to do is we're going to morph uh, these boxes into boxes on this grid. And Grasshopper provides a handy tool where you can build surface boxes, which are these guys. So you can see that now those surfaces now have thickness, and they're, what they're coming out is are actually these twisted surfaces. So I create a panel. Uh, you, or twisted box is what I mean. So you have this twisted box object from there. And then we can actually morph those twisted boxes into B reps using these three objects. So what that actually tries to do is it tries to take the shape of this object here, get the bounding box of it, and then morph that bounding box into these boxes. Um, so the end result looks like this. this here, morph box option selector. So this is um, this component, this gene pool component. So what's cool about this is instead of having a hundred different number sliders, this thing actually encompasses all of those number sliders. So if I wanted to have, I don't know, 57 for some reason, I could do that and have 57 number sliders and just have it spit out as a tree. Um, and right now I have it set. So if you look at these boxes, there are 72 boxes here. So that means we need 72 options. Um, and what this is doing is it, it's on a scale of 0, 1, or 2. And that's relating to we have three boxes here. And we have one box, two box, three box. And then 0 is the most closed and 2 is the most open. And what it's doing here is as these change, uh, zero refers to that box, one refers to this box, and two refers to this box. Um, so that's how you get this layout here, where it's telling it, I want to morph box zero into that spot, box two into that spot, box, box one into this spot. And then all of this stuff here is actually how we're measuring the um, the shadows and the views. So if you look at this face, this is all the buildings here. And what I've done is turned each of those buildings into the meshes as we'd shown in the diagrams and turned all of the uh, and turned the ground cover here into a mesh as well, just like in that diagram. And then built a series of lines that goes from each point to each point. So we have a so we have a, a list of a bunch of forty-eight um, long lists. And then if we check, as we check this, we can see that. 
let's see. I guess I should hide this. And what it does is it calls all of the lines out that intersect with our tree line. So you can see everything here avoids the tree line. And then this one's a little harder to visualize, but it goes and checks intersections with these boxes as well. So make sure that all of the lines that go to the buildings go through a hole or go around the surface. And that way we can measure views. You can see how this goes through there and so on and so forth. And with that, we're able to actually get our uh, median view quotient. So looks like the average, actually I'm going to go turn that back on. So for each of these meshes, the average one of these 48 meshes here, or is it 24 now? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so 25 meshes. So the average of those meshes gets, sees or has nine connections with these buildings. So that's our view quotient. We're able to see it's in some ways a relatively arbitrary number, but it does give us a grasp of the views created towards these buildings. And now that we have a, a metric that we're satisfied with and we're able to measure, that's when we're able to go into um, go into Galapagos. So our genome here is what we actually want to change, which is our boxes. So we, what we want varied is if this is box one, two, or zero, and so on and so forth. And what we want to so that's the uh, that's the genome, the things that you want want to vary. And then our fitness is this median view quotient, or if we wanted to test average view quotient, we could do that as well. And um, so it's connected to this. So now once we've decided on fitness and genome, we can double click on it and run the editor. Um, the default for max stagnant and population are, are much higher, so I, I lowered those down so that it was a manageable size script for this demo. And especially since this demo is not particularly complex. I didn't need a huge population size and a huge um, and a large number of uh, tests to ensure that um, we reached a global maximum. Though I'm sure if we ran this more, we might get closer to a global maximum. But essentially what this does is you have your fitness, which is our view quotient, and you can set that to maximize or minimize. So if it's maximized, we want that number to be as large as possible. If it's minimized, we want it to be as small as possible. Um, Max stagnant and population, initial boost, all of these things measure how the how the generations are started and then how long they go for. So like the generate each population, so each generation of tests will have a population of five. So that means um, how this works is you have your first generation and you'll test for five sets of inputs and then you'll get an output. And then based on those outputs, the, the algorithm will select one or two or some number from there, depending on the algorithm, and um, translate that to the next generation. So if it's like two that get translated, it'll take the two best options. And then based on the inputs of those two best options, it'll create another set of inputs um, with a little bit of variance. It'll in institute a little bit of randomness um, from there. So we have a small population size because uh, it's not super complex. If you had a really complex generative design algorithm, you might want a larger population size to get eventually down to something that's manageable. Um, and then an initial boost. So initial boost in this case, um, what it means is that your first population, instead of being five, will be 10. Um, and then when we want to run this, we'll run the start or we'll start the solver and what it'll do is it'll just run this until it's stagnant. So once things stop changing, it'll it'll stop the solver. And and the stagnation, the point it reaches when it's stagnant again will uh, depend, I think, on the complexity as well. So if you have a lower complexity problem, it'll stagnate a lot, a lot sooner. Um, so you run this. I'm not going to run this right now because it does take a little bit of time. Uh, for this one with those settings, it takes somewhere around 10 minutes to run. Um, but what I did, and this is not actually an out-of-the-box uh, out component, 
um, even though I tried to keep them as such. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, it's actually over here. So there's this Galapagos um, listener, and this is with uh, TT Toolbox. So where is that? I don't actually know where TT Toolbox is in here, um, but it's uh, Thornton Tomasetti's uh, Grasshopper plugin. And what it does is it records if you have a genome and a fitness, um, you plug those same things into the Galapagos listener, and it'll record the outputs. So here's the outputs of a test that I ran earlier, um, where the top one has a view quotient of 10, and then uh, these are the inputs for all of those boxes here. And I took those and stored them here in this data. So if I were to plug this in here as opposed to using what's in the, uh, what's in the genome right now, you'll see this change slightly. So those, those changed down here, and I think a couple things changed over in this area. I don't remember exactly what all changed, but uh, yeah, so there's that being changed. So now that you have all of this coming out of Galapagos, we want to put this back into Revit. So unfortunately, even though Rhino inside Revit is still a smoother implementation of interoperability between Rhino and Revit, you still need to somehow translate Rhino geometry into something that Revit actually understands. So one way we could do this, and this is kind of the, the quote unquote dumb way of doing it, is we could literally just translate each of these objects into Revit as, uh, as direct shapes. And I don't really want to do that. I'd rather have something that Revit understands natively and you can work with a little more natively in Revit. So what I've done is, as you can see, each of these is a box. Hey, Grace. It's a solid box. Over. Yeah. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, so you were mentioning some of the performance things with Grasshopper and Galapagos, and this taking about 10 minutes to run, so you don't want to run it live. And I know you were doing some tests last night, and you were also work, you, you, you've worked with Refinery before. Um, I want to ask you, are there performances difference? Like, because this is running locally, right, um, versus maybe Refinery runs in the cloud. Do you notice a difference in performance or a recommendation for people uh, for a generative design tool, uh, Galapagos versus Refinery, purely based on performance? Um, and then maybe while you're answering that, everyone, I'd like to know before Chris transitions to Rhino Inside, uh, if you guys have used Rhino Inside before or have heard of it, if you guys could just leave a message in the comments so we kind of know where you guys are at on that side, that would be great. But yeah, Chris, take it away on, on performance if you don't mind answering that. Okay. Um, so the way that generative design works with Revit now that it's released is that what it does is you have your like foreground version of Dynamo, which is in the viewer that pops up when you open Dynamo. But what generative design does is it opens six other versions of Dynamo on your machine and backgrounds, so you never see them. Um, so it kind of, and then it performs each of those. Um, run throughs in the background there and then it has those four it what it does is it uses four of those gener uh dynamo threads so if you have um i don't know a population set of 10 it'll run four of them on those four and then once each of those is done it'll run the next iteration and the next iteration on those four threads versus this runs i i don't really know a whole lot about how uh, how Galapagos runs. I, I assume it just runs literally on your Grasshopper instance that's open. So I suppose in theory Dynamo or Generative Design might be faster because it's running four studies at once. Um, but that being said, I would imagine the biggest performance difference is literally just if you're, how complex your script is. And I don't have an answer for if one is similarly complex to the other, if it's going to perform differently or not. Um, and, but yeah, I think that's really what it comes down to. There are definitely things in this script that I could optimize. Um, so if I open MetaHopper here, like some like this solid difference takes seven seconds to run, and maybe there's a better component or a custom coded component that doesn't take seven seconds to run, or in this case, four seconds to run for this guy. Um, you can see that's significantly higher uh, than area or some of these other 
ones that take a while to run. Um, and then as, as, as I, like if I were to increase the density of these meshes here, these would increase exponentially. Um, like I was getting like nine minutes at one point with a really complex version of this. So I think more so than even just one software to another, it's like optimizing your own script and figuring out what nodes are the bottleneck for how long they take and then making sure you can minimize those as much as possible, um, however, however that's done. Okay, I'll get back to the, the Rhino inside stuff now, unless there's other questions on that. Um, okay, so we're talking about Rhino inside uh, inside Revit and how to transform Rhino geometry into Revit. So in order to get this to be um, more native to Revit, I went with an adaptive component. And we can see that each of these here is a box, so it's it's defined by the four corners as and, and we know that here where it's a surface built out of four corners and then extruded. So what I did to approximate these Rhino geometries is in Revit, I went and made a couple adaptive components. So here's one of those. And you can see it's just four points, one, two, three, four, and it has a thickness to it, and it has a void in the middle. And um, I have a property in here. It says right now it's four inches, extruded four inches on both sides. So the panel height's actually eight inches uh, thick. Um, but the nice thing about doing it this way is we have access to all these Revit parameters here uh, that we don't, we wouldn't have access to or as much granularity, I think, if it was a direct shape. Um, at the very least, each of those direct shapes would be their own object as opposed to right now it's like 15 instances of this one family. So it's a little it's a little nicer to work with. Um, and I have a second family here for the full panel. So there's that guy. And then for the two different open panels, I have a thick one and a thin one. So the difference between these is essentially the same as the, where did my grass on? It's essentially the same difference as these two B reps here, where one is more open than the other. Right? So we have our small one and our big one. That's the same difference um, for the panel, thin and thick. So once we have these uh, adaptive components built in Grasshopper, then Rhino inside Revit has this great. Um, adaptive component feature here. So what it what this node does is it takes in the points of the adaptive component and the type of the adaptive component. Um, so the way that I've worked this out is because each of these are four point adaptive components. We have a series of lists of four where each of the where the four in the list are the points, as well as a series of lists of the family types. Uh, okay, so these are right now area tags for some reason. So I will change these. So how this works is you'll get a drop down here, and I want this one to be full panel, and I want this one to be open panel. And the most important part of this here is if you're doing something like this, like what I'm what I'm doing here, where I have these three B reps associated with an item selector and I have the same item selector associated with this item selector, I want my list of um, families to be in the same order as this guy. So if we look here, we have our full panel and then we have our thick full panel and our thin full panel. So it, it goes in decreasing order of um, openness of the panel, similar to how these B reps here are organized. The other thing I've done is I have a dispatch here, and it basically says if this is set to true, then run this adaptive component. Um, and the reason I have that is as soon as this is set to true, these should show up in Revit. So if I turn, so you can see this this stuff is now living in Revit. 
Um, but the problem with this is this actually takes a little bit of time to go and build these in Revit. So when I'm running the Galapagos study, I don't want this part of the script running while a Galapagos is iterating through the script because that just adds an additional amount of computational overhead. So I'm going to set this to false. And then as soon as I want this part to run, which is say I have this Galapagos here and I know exactly which um, combination of inputs I want, and then I'm going to go into here and turn this on so that this comes into Revit. As, uh, all right, so it looks like Revit just crashed. Uh, cool. But anyway, um, we got through that, <laughs> through the demo. So as we wait for this to you know, do whatever it's doing, should we answer some questions? Yeah, so um, first off, apologies. I think there might be an echo on my side. Um, we're working through some of these technical difficulties. But a question that I did, we did get Chris, and as it relates to the performance of this, um, while you're opening up Revit again, um, is that does it make sense to have two different grasshopper definitions, one for Rhino inside and then another one for Galapagos? Would that help at all with performance um, in that sense? Because I noticed you said you're triggering one off versus so that way it's, it's not pushing that geometry over when it's doing the testing. But someone was asking about that. If it makes sense to have different grasshopper definitions from a performance standpoint. I have done the thing where you have different grasshopper definitions um, for different parts of the script. I haven't done it for Galapagos necessarily. Um, I did it in, in school for a script that got pretty complex. Uh, and then the problem with that, and back when I was doing it, flux.io was still a thing, so this was a much easier problem to solve, was that in order to go from one script to the other script, you have to have some sort of way of storing data between the two scripts, right? So you have to have some sort of, um, I don't know, database, whether that's an Excel file or when I was using flex.io, I was just pushing it to their web servers. Um, but either way, you need to know what, like if, if I'm going to run the Galapagos script that gets me this, I need to be able to store this geometry information so that I want, when I open up the script to send it to Rhino inside, it knows what geometry to push through, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me, thanks. And, then, and once I get this open, I can kind of show the, the uh, what, I, what I actually mean by that. This guy up again. All right, so while this is, once this is open, I'll, I'll show where that data transfer would actually have to happen. So let's see. Um, as you can see here, Rhino inside wants these points. And it also wants to know, well, I guess that's the big thing it wants to know is the points. Oh, and it also wants to know here uh, what these, these options, the selected options are. So if we were to run these as two separate scripts, you would have to have a way of storing this information. And you would also have to have a way of storing this information. Um, here so that when it goes to the adaptive component, the adaptive component knows what to do with it or what, what to put into Revit. Right. Do we have other questions? No other questions right now. Okay. 
just a clarification that um, the new generative design tools do run locally in Revit 2021. Um, some people corrected me on that comment, so I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Um, I think they changed that, right, Chris, in, in 2021? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't actually know the details of how it was run in the past. I just, I just know from a conversation with Autodesk that it runs locally. Okay. Um, Any other questions from anyone else? Um, we're going to keep going through here. We have a few other items to go through, but feel free to ask your questions, comments, anything like that in the chat window. Um, Chris, do you have any more to show on here that you wanted to kind of run people through? Uh, I don't think so. I think one thing to be aware of just when you're transporting between the two programs is when all of this stuff, I'm going to turn that off, when all this stuff comes in, it's always pinned. Any any anything that comes from Rhino when it comes into Revit is pinned. So if you want to modify it, you'll have to unpin it. Um, the other thing to note is in Grasshopper here, um, because I'm sticking these families and I'm running the script a second time, it gets mad at me because I'll have identical instances of the family in the same place. So that's another thing to pay attention to when you're running things here. Is if you want to rerun it. Um, the best way to do that, in my opinion, unless someone's found something uh, better, is just to delete all this out and and then redo it. That's good. Hey, Chris. Pete's asking, does Grasshopper require pattern-based adaptive components or just generic model adaptive components? Um, just like different types of Rev Revit adaptive components? Or? Oh, I think oh. If you can do pattern based with like massing families, I, I, I believe the answer is just a generic model adaptive component. I think it's just placing it by itself in there, right? There's no hosting yeah, or anything. Yeah. Like when you, you created that adaptive component, was, was it based on a, a pattern one or a generic one? I based it on the generic one, not the pattern one. I actually don't know um, if it supports that or not. I haven't, I haven't tried. Um, we could try and make a make a family right now and see if it does it or see if it accepts the input. Um, but yeah, if it's quick, I, I think you could try it. Um, I think that would be cool. Let's try it out. Let's just, uh, sure, let's just do it really simply. This is one, this is two, this is three, that's four. Okay. Let's save it as a family. I'll just save it to my desktop. Or actually. Just leave it here. Alright, so it's going in as family one. And And then show up here. Does that go in? Family one. Oh, I might have to. Let's do this again. Family one. I think we're going to need to work on our jokes too in, in some of this quiet time. We need to start pulling out some dad jokes for everyone. <laughs> Alright, I'm going right, to run this real quick. Yeah, there we go. Family one. It does. It does work. You can see all these really awkward thick ones are the family I just made with the pattern based. So. At the very least, it accepts it as an input and sticks it on there. You might have some complex, like, one, one of the issues I had with this was as these families varied in complexity, um, sometimes they would break. I think that's just an issue with generic or adaptive component families in general, but uh, especially things like this where the plane isn't always consistent, that can really screw things up if, if it gets complex and things aren't locked. In, in a plane the way you want them, or relationships to planes aren't the same. 
locked in the way you want them. So something to be aware of there. It's a good comment. So two things to know. Do you have anything else to show, Chris? I think we have two comments oh, that we want to uh, close on. No, thanks. Okay. All right, so the first thing is, is we are launching our e-learning program. So if you guys are looking to do a deeper dive, Chris, do you mind going to the website? And uh, if you go to volvlab.io forward slash e-learning, um, we just started launching our e-learning modules on there. Um, we're gonna, Chris recorded one for Rhino Inside that's going to be on the website today. Um, so this one is Clara's. Um, this one's free here uh, that Clara did. Uh, a deep dive into Dynamo. So if you're interested in checking out some of that, Dynamo Dissected, um, that's available. And then next week, we're going to be doing another Lab Live, ironing out some of these technical issues. And um, we're going to be doing a session on the new generative design tools in Revit 2021. Um, so that'll be on the website um, for you guys to sign up for that as well. So you guys can check that out. So those are two action items. If you guys want a deeper dive in Rhino, uh, inside there will be an e-learning as well as the free Dynamo Dissected and then the generative design 2021 tools for next week. Any other, any part, parting words of wisdom, Chris, things you want people to know, anything like that as it relates to any of these tools? Oh, yeah, actually, if there is one thing that I'd, um, so one weird thing about I know inside in Grasshopper is you can see all this stuff here, um, but I think if I turn this off, yep, it goes away. So the best way to get around that Oh no, I just opened up desktop right now on accident. Uh, the best way, or maybe the only way of getting around that is if you open up Grasshopper and I put this back in. This will take a second. So now it's back. Uh, what you'll want to do is close, so you go up here where you close the script and hit the little red button to close the script. Ask you to save, if you made changes, save it. And now it's here to stay. So, and I just, Got an error again, looks like. Um, I don't know where these errors come from, so this is going to crash. But yeah, yeah that's, that's how you get the geometry to stay inside of Revit, is you have to actually close the script. So if I were to rerun that again, that script again, it would actually change the geometry in Revit to what the new geometry is in Grasshopper. Um, so if you, but if you are closing the script and then opening it again and then change, would just put the geometry like on top of the second set of geometry. If that makes sense. Um, so something to be aware of there. Thanks for the clarification, Chris. Yeah, and sorry guys. Sometimes the software is a little buggy and crashes. Uh, it's the joys I'm of, kind of working on some of that. Yeah, um, I was using the website. Uh, that's good. <laughs> So uh, someone, another question we had, Chris, was can you start incorporating the human UI um, visualizer um, for people that want to use Galapagos? Do you know if the human UI tool um, allows you to use Galapagos? Uh, I mean, the human UI, I believe, is just, it just runs on, um, on the Rhino interface, right? So like if you have a, a, a panel or some sort of like data set, like a number node and stick that into human, it'll human it'll show up as like a graph or as a chart or a table. Um, so because it runs on those generic output nodes, I would imagine it can run with Galapagos. Uh, it might be a little weird because as Galapagos is running through its iterations, maybe it'll like change human over time. Or maybe Galapagos just freezes the whole thing as it's running. I don't know. Um, but I think, I guess it depends what you're trying to do. Like, are you trying to have the human UI show how the inputs change over time? So, like, as as Galapagos changes your input from, like, 1 to 5, you want the human UI to have a little part on your screen that shows the change from 1 to 5? I don't actually know if that works. I've never tried it. Cool. Thanks, uh It'd be something we'll have to test out, check it out, and see if it works. Yeah. Another thing there is, I'm trying, to remember. I'm trying to remember from when I used Human UI if it was linked to the Rhino interface or not. But I think testing out the interaction of that within Rhino inside would be interesting too. Because um, you might be able to overlay Human, human UI, UI interface on elements on top of your Revit model. Good point. And then some people are asking, it, uh, will you be sharing the data set afterwards so people can test out some of the scripts on their own? Uh, I can. Uh, I can. Sweet. Cool. So we'll get it posted yeah. uh, probably to the blog so you guys can check that out. 
Um, someone's asking about Helix. Yes, SketchUp to Revit tool. We are working on that actively. Um, people keep asking us about that, even though it's not been on the website for over a year. Uh, so we know you guys still like and want that. We will be getting that published hopefully June uh, this year, uh, this month. We're looking at getting it published. So thank you for the reminders and the pokes on that. We're actively working on it. So appreciate that. Uh, with that, guys, it is the end of the hour. We appreciate you guys. Check out the e-learning modules, evolvelab.io forward slash e-learning. Check out the blog. There's a fun, bunch of free Dynamo scripts. We'll get the data set published to the blog as well. Um, and then check out Clara's uh, Lab Live next week where we'll be going through the Revit 2021 generative design tools, and we'll post that on the website. Really appreciate you guys today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Happy vibes, happy week, and uh, we'll talk soon. See you guys. And thanks, Chris, for presenting and, and sharing your knowledge with everybody. No problem. Thanks for, thanks for watching. See you guys. Bye-bye.